this workshop is for more physiatrists for musculoskeletal application of ultrasound. And this section is for head and neck. Last week, we reviewed the head and neck muscles and nerves. And I'd like to go over one more time before we go to next um, lecture. So today, uh, let's review what we learned last week. Uh, I have trouble, okay. So let's talk about salivary glands. We're gonna review submandibular and parotid glands. As you can imagine, ultrasound guided injection is much accurate than without guidance. According to Dr. Z's um, team, they did a cadaver study with the dye and then when uh, did the injection without the guidance, parotid gland, the accuracy went down to, without the guidance is, was almost 80% accurate, but with the guidance, under the ultrasound guidance, it was 95 or almost 96% accurate. Even though you know where's the parotid gland, using ultrasound guidance is very important. And in terms of a submandibular glands, the accuracy went down to 50% when you don't use the ultrasound guidance. So therefore our conclusion is ultrasound guided botulinum toxin injections to submandibular glands offer greater accuracy over blind injections. So I am trying to do uh, submandibular glands under the ultrasound guidance. As you guys can see, my pro uh, transducer is underneath of the chin, especially it will be positioned on the end anterior to the angle of the mandible. And then the needle is positioned along the long axis of the transducer. And then you will confirm needle placement in the middle of the gland and start to infuse the botulinum toxin. So once again, my patient is laying in bed. The positioning the patient is very important for you to find out the submandibular gland. The patient uh, is on supine position. You will extend their neck slightly and turning their head to the opposite side. So your patient, another one you have to remember, your, if you do the botulinum toxin injection to prevent aspiration pneumonia, you should not extend their neck too much, slightly extend and turn. And your probe, as we learned under the chin, um, at the end, uh, angle of the uh, mandible. And then you can see my needle is going to be um, positioned along with the long axis of the transducer. And on the right side of the picture, you can see my needle is uh, going into the salivary glands, which is submandibular glands. In the middle, I'm dropping botulinum toxin and it will infuse, I'm sorry, it will diffuse to glands. So this is uh, the uh, cartoon of the submandibular glands and surrounding structures. And the middle picture is the ultrasound pictures. And I uh, copied this one from the radiographic uh, 2006. And um, the left side uh, cartoon, which I tried to draw. So this is the submandibular gland. And you can see the facial artery is your home base. And the facial artery is gonna running through the submandibular glands. So when you do the submandibular gland injections, you have to be careful that you are not dropping your botulinum toxin to the vessels. And then you always double check uh, to see if you're in the glands. And then you can see some dark stripes is coming in. There are one, two stripe, which is the muscle. Um, top muscle is the milohyoid muscle and the lower muscle is the hypoglossus muscle. Then you can imagine from the name, underneath of this hypoglossus muscle, this is why hyperechoic one is the tongue. And then next to the tongue, which is lateral to the tongue, is the um, tonsil. But there's some white stuff tinged because this, even though a tonsil, suppose not white, 
the saliva and air is mixed. That's why you see some white um, hyperechoic stuff here. So if you go to the cartoon, this is the submandibular glands, the facial artery, and then milohyoid muscle, hypoglossus muscle, and tongue, tonsil, you can see it. And then probe or transducer is placed underneath of the chin. And then you will a little bit of, uh, push upward, push your transducer upward to uh, identify the submandibular gland. And this is the vessel which we just uh, um, learned. And under the submandibular glands, you can see facial artery and facial vein is uh, trans going through the uh, submandibular glands. And then this is the carotid artery and external carotid artery is uh, in front of the parotid glands. And then you can see, actually, if you put the ultrasound the transducer, there's a veins, big veins, you can see it, which is the retromandibular vein. So same things to the parotid glands when you do the parotid glands. If you um, do the injection from the um, out of plane or in plane, you have to be careful to avoid these uh, large vessels. And another one is underneath of the submandibular glands, there's lingual artery and vein. So there are so many vessels around the submandibular and parotid glands. So if, think about it, if you do the injection uh, to the glands, but if you, your needle was uh, in the vessel and you drop the botulinum toxin, what could happen? Glands is not gonna get the botulinum toxin. Therefore, the outcome is gonna be not good. Your patient may come back and telling you that, oh, doc, I still drool. So you have to think about where you are dropping your toxin. Therefore, you always make sure your gland, uh, you are, your needle is in the gland. So this is a uh, I screenshot. I had the screenshot from the last week talk, and you can see this is the uh, subcutaneous tissue on the top, and then this is hypoechoic homogeneous one is the submandibular glands, and a little bit of a hyperechoic then uh, submandibular glands is the parotid glands. So almost the submandibular glands and parotid glands posterior lobe is kissing each other. But some people is not, so you have to just go move your transducer laterally to look for the posterior lobe of the parotid glands. Parotid gland is much bigger than submandibular gland. And this is the tongue and the white stuff here, hyperechoic one is the saliva and um, air is the mixed uh, in the uh, tonsil area. So you can uh, identify parotid gland as you move your transducer laterally. So look at the right upper corner, the picture, my transducer is going to laterally that, to find out the parotid gland. And this is the submandibular gland. This is the post, uh, posterior lobe of a parotid gland. Now let's talk about, now I moved the transducer to more proximally. And now my pro, uh, transducer is in front of ear. And then this is the um, parotid glands, uh, homogeneous, high echoic uh, gland, and this is the subcutaneous nerve. But there's dark, round, hypoechoic, much hypoechoic uh, structure is coming out. This is the parotid duct. So if, once again, if you drop the, your toxin in the vessel, it's not gonna work. If you drop your um, toxin to the parotid duct, the toxin is gonna come to your mouth. So make sure identify your uh, right structure and drop the toxin to be effective. And then as you move your transducer to the front, you will see more striped structures, which is the muscle, which is the masseter muscles. So therefore, if your needle is uh, 
um, too close to the masseter, when you drop the toxin, a patient mouth can be dropped. So sometimes you can see more drooling after the injections. Make sure tip of the needle is in the salivary gland. Now, uh, what happens if you submandibular glands, it, you, if you drop the medication in the wrong place? Uh, you can see the weakness of medial mid pterygoid muscles, therefore jaw is gonna be dropped more. Posterior belly of diagastric muscle is also get weaker. And the weakness of milohyoid muscle and ventral part of the diagastric muscles. Therefore, restriction of elevation of oral floor and tongue during deglutition. And once again, this is the lateral pterygoid, which is the mouth opening muscle, medial pterygoid underneath of the mandible, which is the mouth closing muscle. So this cartoon I tried to draw to show you guys uh, where's lateral pterygoid. This is the mandible and then coronoid process. And this is a condylar process. And this is a gigomatic arch. Put your finger to your face. Uh, there is, a, you can palpate the gigomatic arch. In the middle, there's some dimple. And then if you open your mouth, close mouth, you can feel some muscles. But initially you will palpate the masseter muscle. If you go deeper side, that is the lateral pterygoid. You cannot actually palpate lateral pterygoid since it's underneath of the mandible through the hole. So why don't I try to draw this one? Let's draw. Um, I'm gonna practice. Let's say this is a lateral pterygoid, but if you look at it, there is a masseter muscle going to be above the lateral pterygoid. So when you put the probe here, initially you will see the uh, masseter. And then once you remove, let's erase this one. Once you get rid of this uh, masseter, and then you will hit the lateral pterygoid. So I'm gonna get out this uh, draw part. That's clear, clear all drawing. And then I'm gonna move to next one. Oh, I have a trouble with the moving oh, mouse. I have a little trouble where, how I can advance my, oh good. Okay. now. I will show the ultrasound findings. The left side, look at the left side. When you put the probe like a right upper corner picture, I'm underneath of the gigomatic arch. So this is gonna be underneath of gigomatic arch. So you don't see the bone, but the lateral side, there's a bone, which is a condylar process. How do I know? This is the bone shadow, right? Dark. And there is another one, bone shadow, this one, which is a coronoid process. In between coronoid process and condylar process, you see the masseter muscles, this one. And then I'm still close to the earlobe. So there is a salivary gland, which is parotid gland, the anterior lobe. And then fascia underneath of the masseter, you can see the fascia line. And the underneath the fascia, there is a square muscle, which is the lateral pterygoid. So let's Look at the right side picture one more time. Parotid gland, condylar process is going to go like this. And then come coronoid process. And the masseter is covering the lateral pterygoid. So now you are put the needle to drop the botulinum toxin to the lateral pterygoid by using autoplane. So you are doing out of plane and you need to go to the lateral pterygoid. And sometimes I use a nervous stimulator uh, to double check I'm really in the lateral pterygoid. So if you are in the lateral pterygoid, you can see your patient mouth open, close, open, close when the nervous stimulation is on. So this, um, is very important. I'm gonna get rid of this annotation. 
part. So let's say uh, brachial plexus is extremely important when you study neck. So let's try to fill blanks before we start. I don't know you guys um, remember all the brachial plexus, but uh, C5, C6, C7, C81, and then root, there are two nerves coming from the root level. C, from the C5 root, those are scapular nerve coming out. C5, 6, 7 together, the root level gives long thoracic nerve. I hope you guys remember. So let's try to fill the box. And at the end of this workshop, you should be able to fill all the um, root, trunk, drink, um, division cord and branches. Okay, I'm gonna go to next two, slide. So now I typed all the uh, muscles and nerve for you guys. So when you do, uh, when you see the dosa scapular nerve, which is going through the uh, middle scalene in the neck, so dosa scapular nerve coming from C5 root, which supplies the rhomboid, and levator scapular, and then a long thoracic nerve from the C5 to 6, 7 nerve roots uh, will supply serratus anterior. And then the root is going to go become trunk. C5, C6 root together become upper trunk. C7 become, oops, I'm in the wrong place. C7 is going to be middle trunk. And then C81 is going to be lower trunk. After you, see trunk in the neck, uh, the division is gonna be underneath of the clavicle where they never give us any nerve. So if you look at the upper trunk, only two nerves coming out from the upper trunk. Suprascapular nerve, which supplies the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and the nerve two subclavius. So after you pass the trunk, since Brachial plexus is going through underneath of the clavicle, no nerves are branching out. So then the, it divide anterior division from the upper trunk uh, and then posterior uh, division. So each trunk will give anterior and posterior division. So from the um, anterior division of upper trunk become lateral cord along with the middle trunk of anterior division together. And then Three posterior divisions from the three trunks get together, become posterior cord. And then a lower trunk anterior division become medial cord. So three cords, lateral cord, posterior cord, medial cord. And then lateral cord gives two nerve, which is the muscular cutaneous nerve and lateral pectoral nerve to pectoralis major. And uh, muscular cutaneous nerve, uh, there's a cutaneous branch and motor branches. The motor branch supplies coracobrachialis, brachialis, biceps, the three muscles. Cutaneous branch will supply to lateral form of the surface. So it becomes sensory nerve. And then lateral pectoral nerve we already reviewed. From the posterior cord, there are five nerves that are coming out. One is upper subscapularis nerve to subscapularis muscles. And then thoracodosal nerve to the lateral lattice muscle. And the lower uh, subscapularis nerve is gonna go to subscapularis and teres major. And then continue to uh, uh, branch out the radial nerve. Before the radial nerve, axillary nerve is gonna come out and motor branch is gonna be teres minor and deltoid. Cutaneous branch will supply to posterior and lateral surface of the deltoid. And then lateral cord, uh, anterior, uh, lateral cord and medial cord get together makes the median nerve. And then from the medial cord only, it's gonna be ulnar nerve. As long as you remember this brachial plexus, root, trunk, division, cord, and branches, your life is gonna be much easy when you practice ultrasound. So I um, draw a cross-sectional view of the neck at C6 level. So let's talk about the anterior part. This, uh, our, let's say our home base is a thyroid gland and trachea 
and this is the esophagus. And then next to, to in between the trachea and thyroid gland, this is the recurrent laryngeal art, uh, nerve. And then next to, to thyroid gland, if you go to lateral side, you can see carotid sheath. Within the carotid sheath, you can see carotid artery, carotid artery, and then internal jugular vein in between carotid artery or in front of the uh, posterior to the carotid artery, you can see the vagus nerve. And then if you go continuously to the lateral side, you can see SCM. And then in the front is the hyoid muscles. So you see front part uh, of the structure. Now you see C6 vertebra. And then this is your uh, spinal cord and C6 nerve root. This is a C6 nerve root and it gives nerve, a spinal nerve. And then when you see the spinal nerve, uh, this is, the, uh, let's talk about the, this in front of the SCM. SCM is dividing neck, anterior neck, posterior uh, SCM is gonna be posterior neck until you meet the upper trapezius. Between the upper trapezius and post, uh, posterior part of the SCM, we call that posterior neck. So posterior neck include anterior scalene, middle scaling, in between anterior and middle scaling, you can see brachial plexus coming out. And then middle scaling, you remember, uh, those are scapular nerves running through middle scaling and then posterior scaling. Uh, superficial to posterior scaling is gonna be levator scapular. So this is the old neck erector muscles. And then there are uh, very, uh, superficial, you can see it's a small yellow dot. This is the branch of superficial cervical plexus. So, so when you do suprascapular uh, area, uh, the sensory branch is coming from the cervical plexus. So then uh, when you see the vertebra, there's red part in front of the spinal nerve, that's the vertebral artery. And then pre-vertebral um, muscle, this is the vertebra, right? And the pre-vertebral muscle, what do you think? Longus coli, I think it's misspelled. C-O-L-L-I, longus coli. And then when you see the longus coli, that's longus coli. You can see throughout the whole neck, but uh, you also can see something else lateral to the longus coli as you move your transducer close to the um, neck, uh, upper neck, and that's the longus capitus. Longus capitus is uh, origin and insertion is uh, much proximal uh, to the longus coli. Longus coli is uh, from the C23 to the T1, I think T3, but longus capitus is about C6 to uh, the occipital bone. So here, when you cut, um, Axial view at C6, you are not able to see longus capitus. Then I wrote here sympathetic ganglion. Uh, sympathetic ganglion you can find out in front of longus coli. I was trying to look at it. It is extremely hard to find out, but you know, as we get better, as you guys know, I'm not really good at ultrasound yet, but as we practice each other, I think we will find out sympathetic ganglion later. Okay, let's go to next slide. So I want to review a little more about the SCM trapezius, which is the superficial muscles in the neck. So SCM function is a turning head to the opposite side and flex the neck on the same side. So it's just like a turning. You tilt your neck, which is a lateral bending to the left side, and then your chin is going to move to the opposite side. That is the SCM muscle action, which is uh, supplied by 
spinal accessory artery, I'm sorry, nerve, which is the 11th cranial nerve, some people call accessory nerve. This accessory nerve also supplies to uh, uh, trapezius muscles. And then uh, accessory nerve run on the levator scapulae. And as you move your transducer proximally, uh, this nerve will be in between SEM and then it pierces to uh, levator scapulae. Okay, so let's go to next slide. Uh, I'm gonna explain a little bit of pre vertebral muscles, longus coli and longus capitus. As I explained already, longus coli is very long muscles. So the origin is anterior tubercle and surface of the transverse process from C3 to T3 is very long. So you can see from C3 to T3, here, very long, longus coli, upper part, middle part, and lower part. And longus capitus is start from C3, C6. So if you do um, X, look at the axial view at the C6, you may not be able to see the longus capitus, but only longus coli. And the longus capitus is uh, uh, actually is lateral flexion, rotation of the head. So when you shake your head, that's mostly from the longus capitus. Thyroid gland is always popping out, right? But thyroid gland level is C5T1. So when you look at the uh, C5 uh, nerve root, you may not be able to see thyroid glands. But as you scroll down your transducer to C5 to C6 to C7, you will see thyroid gland. These landmarks all are very important for you to identify the cervical nerve root. So posterior neck muscles, let's review one more time. This is the SCM. This is the trapezius muscles. And this is gonna be you can see there is a brachial plexus coming out. Therefore, in front of a brachial plexus is going to be anterior scalene. And then posterior to the brachial plexus is the posterior scalene. I'm sorry, middle scalene. So in between anterior and middle scalene is the brachial plexus coming out. And cervical nerve is going to, this is the daughter scapular nerve. Uh, therefore, this is going to go to uh, rhomboid. And then here one more time, simple one, SCM, upper trapezius, uh, anterior scalene, middle scalene, posterior scalene, levator scapulae, um, splenius capitus, and this is the upper trapezius, and brachial plexus, and then uh, this is the subclavian artery. Okay, then let's go to I like to give you a little tips for um, neck ultrasound. So C5 often travels outside of the interscaling group. Interscaling group means between anterior scaling and the middle scaling. And then C6 looks like a snowman many times when you look at a root in the scale, interscaling group. So C6 is usually two elements, looks like two nerve roots together on ultrasound. And C5 and 6 coalesce into the upper trunk. You can see it if you move your transducer carefully. And long thoracic nerve and dosa scapular nerves run through middle scalene. So when you check middle scalene, actually you can find that dosa scapular nerve more easier than long thoracic nerve. And phrenic nerve runs in front of anterior scalene. So when you see phrenic nerves, there are usually two phrenic nerves you can see. So when you see phrenic nerves at a lower part of anterior scalene, which means more between uh, SCM and anterior scalene, you can find out your uh, phrenic nerve. That means your probe is at lower than C5 level. And when you see phrenic nerves at out of the lateral tip of anterior scalene, your probe is at or almost in between C5 and C4 nerve root. We'll see that from next slide. So this is, I um, have this screen from uh, last week uh, workshop. So we call it traffic 
light sign. So this is the anterior scaling, anterior scaling. This is the middle scaling. There is a traffic light one, which is must be C5, two together C6 and C7. But how do I know C5, C6, C7? So we're gonna go over with the anterior tubercle and posterior tubercle to identify C5, C6, C7 uh, after uh, next uh, slide. Let's say, the, uh, the, let's go over brachial plexus from the supraclavicular uh, supra area, which is the um, probe here. You uh, put the probe on the, uh, above the clavicle. So you can see this kind of a loose tooth shape here. And uh, your home base is going to be subclavian artery. Lateral to the subclavian artery is going to be brachial plexus trunk. Or if you go low down deeper, it's going to be division level. So I made a cartoon here. Subscapulabian artery, go to the lateral side, you can find the division or trunk of the brachial plexus. If you go to medial side, you can find the vein, but you are on the first rib and clavicle. And you can see above the um, brachial plexus, you can see omohyoid muscle. And then if you probe your if you move your transducer proximally, you can see anterior scaling. If you go medial side, you can see um, thyroid glands, but anterior scaling underneath of the SCM, middle scaling, between the anterior scaling and middle scaling, you can see traffic light. So we call it traffic light signal. And then between the SCM and anterior scaling, you can see fraining nerve. This means you are around the C, five or C6 level. And then now you go proximally more, your fraining nerve is almost out of anterior scaling as we learned, which means you are in the uh, proximal C5 and C4 level. And then you will see two nerve roots or one nerve root to C5 and in between anterior and middle scaling. I hope you guys can clearly understand the traffic signal, traffic light signal um, sign or um, a fraining nerve. Let's go. Next slide. Whoops, it's not moving. Okay. Uh, one more time, I said uh, division or trunk of uh, brachial plexus looks like a lotus root. I put the lotus root picture <laughs> down here. So now you can understand better. Uh, first rib, above the first rib, you can find out the subclavian artery and then division of uh, or trunk of the brachial plexus omohyoid, your probe is gonna be above the clavicle and then next to this gonna be first rib there. And then you can see here rotus uh, root and then this is gonna be subclavian artery. This part above the subclavian artery, I'm sorry, above the uh, Brachial plexus is going to be omohyoid muscle. The dark one is a subcutaneous tissue. And then this is a vein. Now I told you we're going to, how we're going to identify the C5 root, C6 root, C7 root. When you look at the um, ultrasound findings, there is a, let's look at the right side. Oh, I found the car carotid artery here. SCM, but something white here and bone shadow, and then it drops and there's another bone shadow you can see it. So this is the anterior part, anterior tubercle and posterior tubercle. Ah, anterior tubercle, posterior tubercle at a same level. So I'm gonna show anterior tubercle, posterior tubercle at the same level and then this is a C5 nerve root. Let's go to left side of the cartoon, anterior tubercle, posterior tubercle, and then C5 root sits there. And then you can tell this is a C5 because anterior tubercle and posterior tubercle is the same height. And then let's look at the uh, below uh, ultrasound picture. Uh, once again, carotid artery, thyroid, trachea, and then SCM here on the top. 
And then you see another bone shadow here. This is the anterior scaling. Bone shadow and then bone shadow. And looks like this anterior tubercle is higher than posterior tubercle. Ah, it must be C6 or it's not C5 anymore, right? So as you move your transducer down, you can see C6 in between anterior tubercle, posterior tubercle, but anterior tubercle is higher than posterior tubercle. Now on the right side, this is a C6 root, but actually you can see this must be also C6 too. So I'm gonna get rid of that. See, two looks like a snowman. This is a C6. You learned that C6 nerve root to usually two elements. Okay, so now you understand. C7, I don't have a picture. When we practiced the last week, we couldn't find the C7, um, the tubercle. So maybe this week we'll try to find out. So C7 here, anterior tubercle is almost is, uh, missing. But if you look at the posterior tubercle is much higher than anterior tu tubercle. Now I identified C7. So once again, uh, to identify C5, C6, C7, you have to look for tubercle of the vertebra. So C5, anterior posterior same height. Um, C6, anterior tubercle higher than posterior tubercle. C7, posterior tubercle higher than anterior tubercle. Okay, now we all understood. Let's go to next one. Uh, once again, um, I draw another picture here. Uh, this is the, um, you can see the lotus root picture here. Okay, well, I think this is, a, I made a mistake. This picture, I could uh, get rid of that. But anyway, we already explained. This is the last slide from today's uh, lecture. Um, now we are moving our transducer underneath of the clavicle. So then what happened? You see? the pectoralis major on the top, and then pectoralis minor. Major, minor, you can see axillary artery now. No longer subclavian artery. Once you pass the clavicle, it's the axillary artery. Axillary artery, lateral to the axillary artery is gonna be the chord of the, because division already passed underneath subclavicle. Now you see brachial plexus, where lateral to the axillary artery, but uh, that is now we call that cord. So lateral cord, posterior cord, and medial cord. This is the um, cords, three cords of the brachial plexus underneath of the clavicle, underneath of the pectoralis muscles. So I wish that you guys can understand the last week had a neck lecture, a uh, workshop through this lecture. And then this Monday, coming Monday, we're gonna go over face muscles and neck muscles, anterior neck and posterior neck muscles along with the brachial plexus. So please enjoy this lecture and then wait for uh, Monday workshop for head and neck uh, and a little bit of shoulder muscles. And I'm, I'm going to start at 7 a.m. Uh, Eastern time, uh, and uh, which will be the uh, Monday. Thank you so much for watching uh, for this lecture. Hopefully, you guys can master this one better than um, head and neck muscles and nerve better than me, since I'm learning a lot. Thank you so much. And I tried to finish my talk. Uh, let's see how I can finish.